Awesome. So I'm so excited to be here. I mean, uh, as a DMC alum who graduated last year, this is a big deal. So thank you guys for the invite. Um, our capstone professor, Cindy Greenglass, she said, you have to tell the story. Uh, and I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll add it on there before. But she goes, um, she's like, I came from a conference in New Orleans uh, two days ago, and we have two industry industries within the credit unions for marketing, and it's two awards. One was CUNA Diamond, which we won in March for all of work in 2018. And the second was for the Marketing Association of Credit Unions. And we also got best of show for that campaign uh, two days ago. So I told my team, I said, unequivocally, we're the best credit union marketing team in the entire country. And you know, it was fired up because uh, we're all relatively brand new. And I started uh, at the credit union uh, just about a year ago running a department. Uh, moving from Los Angeles to now in Kalispell, Montana. And uh, I know I felt one other Kalispell, Montana <laughs> resident here which is pretty awesome, but yeah, completely different market, uh, completely different uh, institution. I'll kind of get into a little more exciting pieces about that and see the challenges that I wanted to take on. But uh, I do want to start with one thing. So the most important lesson I ever learned about data-driven marketing is when I put my own money and my own reputation on the line. And I'm, I'm gonna explain that. So, um, I went fast. So, this is uh, Los Alamitos City Hall, and, and uh, I, was, uh, I ran for city council. This is about a couple years ago. And I had a lot of community members, business members. They said, hey, you got to run. There was a longtime incumbents uh, board. You know, the council never changed. And uh, one of the council members was floating a very impractical financial idea. Uh, it was really going to take the city into the wrong turn. They said, you have to go out there. You're involved in the community. And I said, OK. Uh, at the time, I was doing data-driven marketing and advertising for the credit union co-owned a juice bar. I served on the board for uh, a local not-for-profit uh, uh, runaway youth shelter and also the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I had a, a three-year-old son. My, my wife's pregnant with our second child on the way. So I said, clearly I have a lot of time in order to do this, guys. Um, but sure, I'll, I'll take a look. And um, <laughs> so you know, at this point, you're probably asking yourself, what does running a political campaign for local city council have to do about data-driven marketing? What, what does that really, you know, encompass for, for that? But I wanted to get this point, because data-driven marketing in that bus term is such a, a key component that you can get started with a data-driven marketing strategy, regardless of the size of your institution, regardless of the size of your business or your budget, it can happen. And it sounds a little scary to get started and to shift that perspective of traditional marketing that your firm has been doing to be very much a data-driven marketing strategy and what that actually means. So I spent the past number of years doing data-driven marketing. I say, how can I apply those same principles to, uh, to city council race? I, you know, I wasn't going to get into this race without knowing a clear path to victory, and that had to be driven by data. So the first thing I looked at was, okay, how often do these council members get reelected? Not just in our city, but for outside. And the only thing that's found was house data. And you can kind of see that across the board for, for since the 60s, like 95%. And then you have in, in the high 90s for state and then the first council races about you know, 96%. So there clearly was great odds in my favor to knock out an incumbent that was doing this. Um, <laughs> but I said, okay, let, let me look at some other pieces on here. What, what else can I do? And I want to take a step by too, because it also says there's a passion in it for me. I, I love the community, and it's kind of talking about the community engagement piece of it. Um, it there really was a, a drive to say, hey, there's ways we can make your community better. I raised my family here. I want to do for this and give back to my community, and local government's a great way to do it, uh, not as a means to get to where you want to go in your career, but just to give back and say, how can we put you know, a, uh, a, a better park at place? Um, Long story short, I want to tell you I won. But when I was in that process of doing it, you know, for example, I met a woman who had a, a child who was on the spectrum. She lived on the corner of a crosswalk where there was no stop sign. And she says, cars go by here 40 miles an hour in a residential street. There's been a couple collisions. I'm really scared for my son. I'd love to get a stop sign. I said, you know what? I'm going to get you that stop sign. Eventually, I did. But um, so Bottom line is that it comes down to, to getting data to make actionable decisions. And uh, when you're running for public office, there's a really cool thing. So the registrar uh, for the county gives you the voting data for everybody who's registered to vote. 
And what's a little bit scary is they also give you the voting history, not actually what everybody voted for, but every election that they voted in. And then what party they voted in, what primary, birthday, name, where they were born, I mean, kind of scary stuff. And I'm just like, oh, you gave me all this? Great, I'll go with it. But my hunch was this, with the data, I can probably accurately predict if someone was going to vote. And if I could do that, I knew I could have a pretty good chance of, of finding out, of getting the right message to, uh, to that right person and getting, that, uh, getting the win there. So this allowed me to determine when somebody was going to, to vote. What was also interesting is that for California, you have mail-in ballots. Mail-in ballots uh, typically go six weeks before the election, and I found research that supported most of those ballots were returned with one week. So by the time you get a mail-in ballot, for example, you pretty much they fill it out and they send it in. And the other section goes out and votes in person. And that's the majority for, for most of, of voting. So now I know something very important. I knew when somebody was going to vote, because I know they're mail-in or in person, and um, I can segment that and really overcome two big obstacles. One was money. I didn't really have any to go do this. And the second was time. You had a finite time in order to get there. But now I could segment that, target those individuals who are going to be voting and win, and get my message across. So now I was ready to go. Um, I uh, crafted a strategy. I put my flyers out there, too, created a, a website. And um, I used you know, the most important marketing tool of all, cute kids. So this is my son and my niece. Um, they're holding, obviously, Josh Wilson for Los Alamos City Council signs out there. And when you knock on doors and, you know, I had a couple of signs made and say, hey, you want to put a lawn sign out there? Absolutely. You know, you can't say no to a three-year-old um, <laughs> or your dad. So it was interesting, too. On the website I, I put out there, um, I wanted to go out and I put all my policy positions out there. And I put stuff about me. And I created flyers. But I... Um, the simple pitch was this, I also needed the personal contact. I mean, I can't spend a huge amount of money on direct mail pieces or anything else. I, the personal contact was key. So I went door to door. I said, you know, hi, I'm Josh Wilson. I'm running for Los Alamos City Council. Here's more information about my policies. Do you have any questions? That was it. Most people said, oh, no, that's good. Thanks so much. I maybe probably got a dozen questions on there. I'm like, OK, cool, you know, policy questions, that's great. But you know, it, it wasn't really kind of breaking through in that sense. So part of a data-driven marketing is actively measuring, testing your marketing, and determining results and how you can adjust. And what I found was that looking at the website traffic, this is after kind of getting the mail-in ballots, most of the people after hitting the website were going to pages about me. And then second was the issues. And even then, it wasn't as popular on there. So I said, that's really interesting. More people care about me as a you know, person and a candidate than they do about policy issues. And on this website, I mean, it's, it's like fluff, right? You know, business owner, um, you, know, commute, you know, credit union uh, you know, uh, manager, and involved in this piece, I started the Winter Wonderland Festival, um, which was bringing snow to Southern California. And it's actually one of the stories that kind of really got me passionate about this. We, we brought a, a bunch of snow to an area where it does obviously get snow. I had a single mom at the time before I ran. She came up to me and she said, I have, I'm a single mom, I have two kids, I can never afford to take my kids to snow. This is the first time they've ever seen it. And uh, it, like that kind of piece, I'm like, this is what community service is about. So I put those stories on there, because politics, you gotta promote yourself as a brand, and that's one of the stories I kind of talk about. But I so said, that's interesting. So how am I going to update my, my campaign? And it, I went to the next door, I, I went to the flyers, and I focused about me, and I said, hi, I'm Josh Wilson, I'm running for Los Alamos City Council, and this is more information about me. Do you have any questions? And then the engagement started happening. So I got the validation on election night, uh, and clearly we won uh, <laughs> for the campaign. But it was really cool is that we got the most votes for anybody at city council. I was the youngest person ever elected to city council. We knocked out the incumbent. Uh, you know, really great results. And as they came through over time, the, the mail-in ballots get posted first, and then all of the precincts get posted afterwards. And the vote actually increased uh, as the precincts were counted, because that, that in-person voting, or sorry, uh, and that's the cohort I targeted at the end, resonated with more of that message I shifted to about me. But that was very much driven by data during the campaign and, and actively promoted. So I, I want to kind of bring it back a little bit to data-driven marketing. Because at the end, it's about growing revenue and containing costs. 
with all marketing, you have a limited budget, a limited amount of time and resources, and you need to get the, the people and the message that is best suited for who you want to target. Um, and then I'm going to borrow some stuff from, from the data marketing program because I, I love it. I think it's great material. So data marketing is a discipline that takes data, applies intelligence and strategic analysis to provide key insights to develop and refine marketing communication activities. So those insights are key. You have to understand the data in front of you and look at it and find actionable items on there. The mantra I take to my team is this, and this is important. We want to deliver the right message to the right person at the right time. Let's say another way. The right offer, the right credit card campaign, the right car loan to the right person at the right time. Now, for an institution that I'm at before, you know, that's a completely revolutionary way of thinking because in the summer we advertise car loans and in the home, home loans are advertised in the spring and in this, so we advertise this way. Different mindset. We want to capture those people when the need is actually there. And that's the data-driven component. So how do you work that? How do you get the data that you want? And I'll probably read some of this too, or if you guys can take a picture of it, it's easier. But there's really four different core types of data. There's audience data, that's the demographic, psychographic information. There's the transactional data, the spending habits. This is what the bank account information is, where you're spending your money, where you're taking it in from. Behavioral data, so this is where the customer engages with the brand, identifying the customer's journey. For example, where is, are they going on the website for the campaign? And then intent data, information collected about a customer's activities that can, say, predict what they're going to do. So for me, for example, on the um, political campaign, all of that, that data I received, I created a simple equation to say, if somebody had voted in every election for the past 10 years, they're most likely going to vote. If they didn't vote in the last election, 2008, when there was uh, a non-incumbent president and the election we're going for, they probably wouldn't be bothered to vote in this time around. Or if somebody just registered to vote, they are the, probably the most likely person to go out there and, and vote because they're super engaged. They took the time to register, and you know they're going to go out there. So that segmentation was key. And like I said, I got that data for free. Um, but it gives you an opportunity to say, what data do you want to focus on based on your campaign? And you choose one of these areas of focus, or you can choose a combination. But you make that subconscious choice beforehand to say, what data do I need in order to make those actionable decisions? So, and that kind of goes for, for uh, the, my core rules kind of working for marketing and data. Data has to be democratized. So with that, the data that you receive has to be able to share it. You have to be able to tell a story with that data. If you can have this, uh, you know, this burden data and, and you can't collect it and send it out and tell a story to convince your C-suite executive who does not necessarily have any background in this, it's not going to be useful. And you have to define your domain and test it. Um, you know, in statistics, I think it's called uh, hypothesis testing modalities. This is really getting a core group uh, of data. How can we test this and actually get results within that confines? But the goal is to get inferential data. And that really means this. If this is true, then this is true. If this is not true, this is not true. You, you want to get at the heart of saying, what data analysis can I bring that actually resonates and says, I can make action of this. There has, uh, there's inference there. And the more information you have reduces the overall uncertainty as long as it's shareable within that domain and it's inferential. So I'm going to give some examples for, uh, for the credit union that I'm working at too and, and kind of how this all comes together. Uh, a little information about Whitefish Credit Union, it's an 80 plus year institution based in Northwest Montana. We have a uh, billion and a half dollars in assets, 56,000 members, it basically makes us the largest in the entire state. Uh, but we also had some problems, and I'll kind of go over for specifically the campaign, mostly in that um, we have an older membership base, and we also don't do things traditionally. Uh, show of hands, how many of your banks do not offer checks with your checking account, like physical paper checks. A couple, okay, interesting. Yeah, so majority don't, or majority do, right? We don't offer checks. We also don't have CDs or money market accounts. Um, our website for, this, for the company, the first website launched 10 years ago, 2009. And when that launched, it was three pages before there. So th there's, a, there's a mentality of, of getting into this when, when I got the job that said, like, you know, there's a lot of work to do on the marketing front. Um, 
and we need to find our brand and our domain, but drive that with data. So convincing for, for our brand to get to a certain point, we need to really find a way to image that. So we ran two Super Bowl ads this past Super Bowl. One was a 30 second spot that played right before kickoff. The other was a 60 second spot that we played right after halftime. Before you think, I didn't probably see these ads and we definitely did not pay 4.5 million per 30 seconds. <laughs> many years worth of my marketing budget, uh, but we can segment it in our market. And the beautiful thing about Montana is that a lot of things are cheap, including TV spots. So uh, you get an idea of kind of where we're taking the brand, and I'll explain the data story behind it. Dear Northwest Montana. You taught me how to show up, rain or shine. Not to be scared of hard work how to commit yourself to being different in order to stand up. No matter where life takes me, I will always be a Montanan. I will always be a Montanan. Love, Maggie. Love, Parker. Anywhere, anytime, anything is possible. Introducing eco checking from Whitefish Credit Union. Make anything possible. Pretty cool, huh? That's you. Yeah. So if you guys are not skiers, you're probably like thinking, oh, that's a lot of snow. <laughs> but for two, for our market, um, everybody skis. This is very much this the mountain that we have. Uh, those are. One is an Olympic athlete, um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little about it, but we basically had a problem coming to this camp, coming to the credit union. We wanted to grow adoption, but we had like an average member base of like in our late 50s into 60s. Most credit unions and banks are like in their low 40s. We didn't really have a whole lot of youth. Um, our checking account adoption, most of didn't offer paper checks, was, was down. And we know we need to say, how can we pivot and really offer a green checking account without checks and no paper statements um, and make it a way that applies to our market. So we developed eco-checking, but we didn't want it to be green in the sense of environmental. We wanted it to be outdoors. So we wanted to identify ourselves as a bank institution or financial institution that allowed people to go out, out and outdoors and allow them financial freedom to go out and explore Northwest Montana and live that lifestyle. And that really came out with a lot of research that we did beforehand. So we selected uh, Maggie Voison, who, who's the main there, she's a two-time Olympian, X Games gold medalist, and then the guy that's doing the backflips, uh, he is an up-and-coming uh, pro skier who got recent some big contracts, uh, but they're also longtime credit union members, and they're, Maggie, for example, was on local parades downtown, and she's a big thing in our market, and she resonates a lot with the youth. I mean, she's like 22. So, uh, and she started Olympics like when she was like 16 or 15, she's like one of the youngest that competitors. So we, we did this and we, we really got to the base. Now, what's cool about this is that once we launched this, um, this commercial Super Bowl, we planned beforehand, we said, okay, where's the sales funnel gonna go? We, we're gonna make sure that we have our website ready to go and we launched that, we had the images, we had her, her uh, you know, promotions out there and we saw traffic spike Eventually, after four months, we had 100,000 plus hits for both those videos on our YouTube channel. Whitefish Credit Union commercial actually is higher than Whitefish Credit Union um, for, for, our, for our SEO rankings. And uh, the, we had checking account adoption actually go up, so the bottom line. But it really invigorated our brand and how we're going to transition and pivot to say where we want to take ourselves as an outdoor lifestyle brand. While most banks show beautiful pictures of mountains and lakes, we're gonna show people interacting with those mountains and lakes in a dynamic way of showing it. So when we looked at all the results, 
auto loans were up, credit cards were up, um, interchange income, which is debit card usage, was up. Online banking was up. Everything that we can see is say, you know, if last four months compared to the previous years, we were up in all these categories. And it wasn't necessarily people came in and say, oh, I saw Maggie Voison on her eco checking commercial or the billboard on the highway. Um, but we had that excitement and we launched our website to promote those images and associate our brand that way. But that digital engagement, that data strategy also came with how can we search? So we didn't see much in conversions. Our display ads, for example, we looked at the, the click-through rates, we looked at the conversion rates, and we modified it for Hulu and YouTube, and those areas where our demographic was actually responding to it. And those were the data points that we led. The bottom line is the goal is to win over the C-suite. And you need to do that by looking at problems and solving them with data. Now, um, think about this for your own brands. You guys want to raise your hands, great, but I, I'm more kind of curious because this is how we used to do it and how we're going to go. How many for your annual marketing budgets plan the year and say, okay, we're going to have a million dollars, 20% is going to go to digital, 20% is going to go to radio, we're going to spend 30 on um, you know, SCM and TV, and we're going to, we have our goals, we feel confident we're going to hit this. Here's the budget, execute, go. Does that sound familiar you know, to you? All right, that's how it's really easy, right? You get, here's your $200,000, here's your million dollars to spend on digital. We're going to go forward and we're going to execute within there. We feel confident we're going to hit it. Makes adjustments along the way, but have it. Where I'm taking the department and the team and how we're doing a data folks strategy holistically on marketing is to say, overall, what's the corporate goals? And what does the research tell us? All right, our CFO. How many mortgage loans do we need to hit? 500 you know, a month or you know, 200 car loans a month. The data shows that we can't hit 500 car loans in a month because the opportunities are not out there. Or we can hit 300. And in order to hit 300, because that we have tested this and we defined our domain and we know that the click-through rate on our, our display ads, if we want to get 300 car loans on our website, it's going to have a conversion rate of 3%. It's going to have a cost per acquisition of 250 bucks. Let's do the easy math on here and say, if you want to hit your number, this is what it's going to cost in order to do that. And we supply the data. So you start with those goals first, you solve them with data, and you let that drive the conversation. The last thing you want to do is say, hey, we, we have a really great campaign here, but we need more money. And, and the finance side is, well, no, we didn't budget for that for this year. But the ROI is there. So you start with that first and, and let the goals drive the, uh, the session. So I was actually a little embarrassed to show this one. Um, this is, and I felt a little better after say we, we won best to show for this concept. And, and I kind of want to say, put you into to my shoes. So you're brand new leading a marketing department for a credit union. And mind you, we, we know they're a little, a little bit behind the times and you sit at a production meeting and say, okay, we're gonna launch our very first credit card. I'm like, okay, about time, that's awesome. Um, you're like, okay, so you know, tell me about the product. Like, you know, we got Samuel L. Jackson and Jennifer Gardner on there, like talking credit cards about all these cool things. What do we got? Whitefish Credit Union, go. What's ops? Credit lending, everybody. So, okay, does it have rewards? No. Does it have travel? No. Does it have cash back? You know, like 5% of gas and groceries and 1% of everything else. You know, changing categories? None of that. Does it have a intro rate? You know, like 0% for 18 months? 12? Six, nothing. We got nothing on the credit card. We got, uh, we don't have much. I said, okay. I'm like, this is going to be a challenge, right? Um, it's like, so what do you have? I said, well, we got a low rate, and we have no annual fees and no balance transfer fees. And I'm like, okay, so it's like every other credit card out there. So as marketers, you're thinking, okay, how am I going to promote this, right? What's our goal? Four hundred thousand dollars in balances within the first last couple of months of the year. And I'm like, all right, so we, we looked at the strategy and we said, okay, we, we feel confident about it. But, and I'll kind of go to the data components after I'll show you what we sent. But I, I work with our creative team. We have an agency. They don't do anything related to banks or financial marketing, but they're, they know outdoor brands and I wanted that perspective coming into them. So I said, how are we really gonna promote this? And oh, by the way, we don't have much of a budget to work with. So we came up with this mailer for a, pre, for a direct offer and uh, I'll show you the experience uh, of the mailer. I 
I think it's loading. <laughs> Amazing, right? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is like really less impactful on here too. Um, perfect, okay. It was on there earlier, right? Okay. Yeah, you can help it out. Yeah, I can go there too. Um, gotcha. Okay. So I'll start with the problem that we had. Oops. Oh my God. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Can I try this one? Yeah. yeah. Codec unavailable. All right. Well, that's a bummer. Um, so we'll play it eventually, too. The bottom line is we end up sending a video mailer. Uh, when you open it up, it played a video on here. And I don't have an example other than the video that's showing out there. But it was basically us owning the, um, owning the product. So we went through a creative video in a process. And we basically said, yeah, it doesn't have rewards. It doesn't have cash back. It doesn't have points. But it's a really great card because it's going to save you money. But the data story behind it is that we did our, 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 um, our work. And we said, OK, who are the people that are most likely to benefit from this, from this card? 25 to 50 years old. They usually have dual, dual incomes with kids. These are the type of people that if you have a Christmas gift, a major purchase, a car repair, a surprise medical bill, they're putting it on their credit card and they're paying it off um, at the end of each month. That's OK. Um, and with that, we said, OK, we're, we're going to have 1,000 people that we're going to target at most for this. Um, but we are going to, to really get the results. But we also tested it as well. So we sent this video mailer. Um, and we also sent a traditional letter mailer. And we tested both results to say, OK, what is going to be a video mailer versus a traditional letter mailer? And what we were surprised the results to say that while most direct mail responses are about 2%, we achieved a higher rate. Our video mailer got close to 7%, and our, even our, our letter mailer got 5 And while these are small numbers in terms of that, it was a highly segmented and highly targeted market that we did. And we attribute that mostly to our data-driven and data selection prior to going out there. Uh, it's interesting. I got, for this campaign, we got notified that um, you know, one of the credit union journals wanted to call us. And they said, write an article about how direct mail is dead. And uh, we want your opinion because we saw that you won an award for direct mail campaign. And I said, it's far from it. Well, what do you mean? I said, if you're sending out an every door direct mail to an entire neighborhood, yeah, you're going to get less than 2% response rate. You're probably going to get like 0.6. But do the work, cut down your costs because it's extremely expensive, and, s and target there. Spend some time up front doing your data research and seeing who's actually going to benefit from this. The right product, the right offer to the right person at the right time send it out to them. So the people that we sent this offer to have $15,000 of the credit card debt paying 20%. So I said, I'm going to cut it down to seven, and we're going to lower your monthly payment by 400 bucks per month. They jumped on this offer. And we actually ended up seeing a higher tail uh, of the responses, where at the end of the year, we hit $1.3 million in loan balances uh, versus that goal of 400000 So we made believers within the C-suite of, of that campaign. Yeah. yeah. Question on this side? Sure. So you've got 528 videos, 526 uh, mail, so 1,050 roughly. Yeah. What's your universe of members? So how much did you, did you have 25,000 members and you picked the best 1,000 according to your data or what? That's pretty much it. So um, 55,000 is the overall top. Okay. We, we segmented it down. We used proprietary uh, algorithms through Experian or Credit Bureau, uh, which is give you a propensity score. And this is where, as marketers, I personally love stats and getting into the weeds for this stuff, but you don't. You don't have to do that. Um, LexisNexis, Claritas, uh, you know, the credit bureaus, they all have great data, but they'll give it to you and they say, okay, here, here's the analyst version, here's the most likely to respond. So we drew the line 
Our ops team also said we don't want to be inundated with cards because we're scared. We don't like change and ours would be a hard piece. So only give us like, you know, a little at a time. So okay, so I drew the line right about 1,000. We broke it into two separate cohorts and we did, you know, A-B testing essentially on those messages to say what's the better response. And that's where we got uh, the video mailer, but really data-driven marketing was, was the driver for this. So I do kind of want to leave you guys with, uh, with this. For data-driven marketing strategy, you have to get started somehow. You can get started with a strategy, but it's about finding the data you need to make actionable decisions. You need to actively test, measure, and adjust your marketing efforts during the campaign. And in order for it to grow with data, it needs to be democratized, create models and retest, get inferential data so you can make those decisions, and more information reduces the uncertainty. You can win over the C-suite with this strategy, but it requires solving those problems with data. And, and I want to leave the kind of last piece. This is like the very first thing in my career and kind of what got my passion of it. Um, we ha I had an old, C old school CEO who liked to open the paper every single morning and read multiple or read his newspapers, as in multiple newspapers. And he wanted to see our ad in every single one of those newspapers, mm -hmm. along with the entire market in Los Angeles. We were spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on ads. Now, some of you are laughing. Does this sound about right? Yeah. yeah. OK. So I said, how can we track this? Well, you know, I go down to the branch, and I talk to the branch manager. And I say, we see the ads, and we get people to come in there. And you know, it works, because I see the ads. That's OK. I'm going to do something simple. If you allow me to show you results, and if I can quantify some measure return, will you allow me to shift some of these non-performing papers to digital advertising? And this is like digital display, search engine marketing, all that stuff was completely foreign. All programmatic was, was not kind of the radar. Um, he said, OK, what do you got? So every publication, I put a unique 800 number on it, toll free. And I worked with the IT team, and we tracked every single one of those calls. Now, at the end of this thing, I had a full list of how many calls I had, how many dollars we spent. And since I had the phone numbers, how many actual, actual applications we've taken from, from those ads. And some of these publications literally being $1,000 per call cost, or thousands of dollars per application. And some produced really well. But by the end of this, we kept two papers, cut the other 10, and we tr transitioned that thing over to digital. And we ended up growing our account, our, uh, our digital loan applications and our overall loans immensely. So the bottom line is that you guys can get a data marketing strategy. You can start small and build up, but the results breed believers. And you guys can all make that happen. So that's all I have for two. I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have. Absolutely. Um, I want to like pull up my laptop and show you guys a video mailer and, and kind of show because there was a big issue with that. So we sent this creative um, to our to our team. It was this video mailer that we speak of, but we targeted it to 25 to 50 years old because we knew it was going to be a big deal for our members to get behind that. This is a membership base. Like I never been to an annual meeting for a credit union that had more than like five people because right, who cares about that? It's procedural. But this one goes to, like. To hundreds of hundreds of people, and it's a very much older demographic. So we, uh, we sent out these video mailers to target 25 to 50, because that's where the balances were kept, and we adjusted that creative, sorry, not here too, we adjusted that creative to, the, um, to that. And you open it up, it's a video. It, it looks you know, very interesting in the sense that it looks like it's really expensive, and, and it's not terribly. But what we had was, and I didn't really account for this, is we sent it to members who are 25, 50 that live with like, parents and grandparents that are over the demographic. So while we got rave reviews from like, people that had it and they felt really special receiving it, the older member clientele that got you know, a hold of these pieces absolutely hated it um, without passion. And we, we got you know, complaints about why are we advertising the Super Bowl. But what we ended up saying is, OK, if we prepare and we say CEO or CFO, we know we're going to get complaints with with um, our piece. This is the reason why we're doing this. 
This is the, the data behind it that supports it. If we get complaints, they're going to be few, and we can't take our direction as an organization from two people that complain. So do we get resistance? Absolutely. Do we anticipate it? Yes, as best as we could. Um, but it was an absolute challenge for, for our market and still remains to be, which is why we're doing things like hiring a local young hero who won't necessarily offend an older crowd and, and bridge that gap to make that comfort zone and do it over time and transition for our market. Um, this is going to be probably really low. You guys can see it. Yeah, we can kind of connect later and see if we can, if we can do it. Um, is there any other questions I was going up to? Yeah. Uh, this is more for your campaign. Um, so I know next year the, the, the maps are going to change. I don't know how Montana works, but, but I know the, uh, the district maps are going to change a little bit because of the California census. So how does the message change? Because you'll probably get new voters or different voters. So how does the message change? Do you renew the process of getting those people into your campaign, your messages? How does that work, I guess? Yeah, so um, you're talking about congressional maps and yeah. redistricting for John, too. Um, so uh, fun fact about Montana, we have one rep uh, for the entire state. <laughs> so uh, it, unless it, it, it's that is actually a very interesting political question because if the areas, if the population goes down by not being counted, I'm not going to get into politics too much, but if the immigration question is a big debate, then that would actually raise the level by other states and we could get a second rep. Um, so interesting dynamic there, right? But at the overall, so how do we deal with, say, different populations, different incoming? I would say probably one out of every 10 people that's in our market is probably native Montanan. We have a lot of influx and a lot of different personalities that come in there. It works to our favor because we have that attrition through our market, that churn through our market, where we get younger individuals in. The challenge for us is that when you come from an area that is not heavily invested in a credit union and you don't have that legacy to bank behind, which is what people think that we don't need to advertise, we've been here for 85 years, you, have, you get that issue of not trying to, you know, issue of trying to appeal those new incoming residents while not alienating the older ones. So, um, we do it by targeting, and that's the strategy we have to. So like, when a new resident shows up, we send them a mail or we send them an email, you know, we go out there and make a personal connection. Those commercials were fantastic. Thank you. Your production value is extremely high. Is that original footage you shot for the Yes, 100%. So fun fact about that, uh, it wasn't terribly. We had a local agency to do that. And uh, the agency that we use, uh, when they put it on their YouTube channel, their insurance agent in New York City saw it on YouTube and canceled their insurance for being too high of a risk. <laughs> They're really proud about to tell me. They're like, hey, our insurance got canceled. I'm like, that's a problem, right? Uh, well, it's fine. We'll get a new one out there, too. Some guy from New York saw our ad, and there's a guy doing backflips on there, and that was against our policy or something. We'll be fine. I'm like, OK. So anyway, rates are going to go up, obviously, for my side and the client's side. Um, and then the, the individual we had that was doing the backflips, uh, he's like 19 years old, and he's done some amazing things. If, if, uh, if he's searching his Parker Costain, and he's done some like helicopter drops and crazy stuff. He uh, like lost his big, to like, big toenail from a, a hit from a, one of those jumps, and he was skiing with a back brace his second day, uh, you know, going out there. But he, um, he loves this stuff, and we were able to do it. I don't have any good news. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> I know. So you guys can kind of see on here too. I know this is really exactly how you want to be seen. So this is a video mailer. And as they open it up, they get this really awesome high production value video. Hi, I'm Josh with Whitefish Credit Union. I want to say congratulations. You're pre-approved for our awesome new credit card. An awesome new credit card you ask? Does it have amazing points to help fly you around the globe? Maybe it has cash back to fund those fire dancing classes you always dreamt of. Not a chance. <laughs> Our card doesn't have any rewards program. And that's why it's awesome. <laughs> that doesn't sound awesome. Our card comes with a great rate. That's half the national average. But that's not all. With our card, you won't be charged an annual fee, balance transfer fee, or a cash advance fee. We don't like fees, do we, Bucky? <laughs> sure, it's not a cash back card that gets you 1% on all your purchases. 
I'm no mathematician, but I can tell you your high rate card minus 1% equals still a high rate. So stop being fooled by all the gimmicks, teaser rates, and flashy commercials from cards that offer rewards just to charge you a high rate. Focus on what matters. Make the switch to Whitefish Credit Union's brand new credit card. Create your own rewards program. The new Whitefish Credit Union credit card has no balance transfer fees, no cash advance fees, and no annual fees. Just a low fixed rate. Whitefish Credit Union. We belong to you. You see why we upset the people over 60? <laughs> Thank you. Play on service. Appreciate you guys keeping along with it too. How many of those did you send out? So, 528. About less than ten dollars a unit, and about a buck to mail. Yeah. And then you had a production company shoot the video, then you put on that too. Oh, that was an iPhone. Oh, you're kidding. I'm not kidding. Right. I mean, it's, it literally shoots and broadcasts 4K. Um, and like I said, we didn't have much of a budget. I wanted to spend on the video mailer, and okay, that played well in Northwest Montana. I was in Home Depot when those things went out, and I'm like, okay, like ho hopefully get two. It's like the weekend it hit, and the guy sees me and goes, I'm with my son buying lumber or thing, fixing our toilet. Hey, you're on that credit card commercial. Yeah? Your baton twirling needs work. <laughs> Walks off. Yeah, that same spot on TV as well? We actually did. So it got a positive response rate on there too. We cut it down to a 30. We basically edited the, the first that said, hey, we're interested in your wife's credit credit card. And it played out there. And that's a big part of our campaign that we put on Hulu. We made it a 60 on Hulu over the top, or, and then YouTube as well. Um, it is on YouTube, on the Tigo Whitefish Credit Union channel. And to be honest, our Dollar Shave Club commercial, the very first one that launched him, was our inspiration for how we did that. Yeah. That, that, that was what we had. Yeah, if, if you guys search Dollar Shave Club and someone has all the views, it, it really is a low budget production, but it's how we launched it. And that's where we kind of made mindset. And this is more about branding and the data marketing. But okay, if you guys have a product as marketers, and you're going to think, God, what am I going to do with this thing, right? you got no rewards. I can't compete with Samuel L. Jackson. I can't be with Jennifer Gardner and all this stuff to you. Own that. Your customers won't care. Okay? They do business with you because they like you. I, I mean, I, I, I ran a, a, a bank branch in California, $100 million in assets, the largest one that was there. And I said, I want the mom who has two kids in the school district and needs a part-time job and willing to make sure flexible with their schedule because when the other moms come in to do banking, She's going to see there, and they're going to talk about the local you know, baseball team that they're on, and they're going to connect. And I want that connection with that, with that individual and that member, because that's why they're going to come in the branch, and that's why they're going to bank with us. That's hard to do you know, for across the products, but it speaks to the fact that if you make that connection, the most online original checking account or banking account or software, it won't matter, because people trust other people, as, as the last speaker just said, and they, they want that connection. That's what they strive in this, in this area. That's where you get your success. So for something like this and, and how we can kind of personally touch, um, you know, go to the little cafe and lunch, and, and sure, I was talking to the waitress. She's like, I got your mailer. And I said, I'm like, OK. I'm like, she, now she has a lot of credit card debt. I'm like, I look how bad as I know people got these things. Um, and, and she goes, and I'm like, but I felt really special about that. And we started talking about it. And, the weird thing about like, being at a bank is that people open up about everything. She goes, you know, I had a divorce, and I got stuck with all of his debt, and I'm just trying to bury myself out of this hole, and I really can't get ahead. And I'm like, you're probably paying about 20-something percent, right? Yeah. You know you can get a better rate, and that's why we sent this offer to you. She goes, yeah, I saw your rate was like, you know, like 8%, and, and I think I can do it. I'm like, we only send these people that are really going to benefit, and I think it really will benefit you. And she got it. She's like, she came back. She goes, I'm saving 300 bucks a month. I mean, that's something for me that my kids can now go to like the sports leagues, or I can afford an extra, you know, night out. It, that's real money to people in Montana, and that's where overall marketing has to do. You have to create value with your efforts. If not, you're just part of the noise. If I sent an offer via email or a standard mailer and we just blast it out, you're part of the noise you're going to throw in the trash. Even if they do business with you, they might open it up throwing trash. But I sent this because I said I want to do something different for our market. I'm just a little bit quirky and out there to get their attention. But I also want to make sure there's value created with that. And I'm only going to send an offer to you if there really is that value there. Hey, we honestly 
care about you, and you think that they can help you, and that's why you're here. It's not because we want to grow our, our, our business. Right. Of course, do. So yes and no, I'm gonna tell you why. Th there's a creep factor that goes along with it, right? But there's also personal factors. There's ways you can combat it. You send the offer, you put it out there, but you follow up with a, a, a warm call. They already do business with you, for example, and you say, hey, we send this offer, make sure you received it. It's that warm personal connection. At the same time, everybody loves getting like going to Wayfair and then seeing the exact same thing they saw in Wayfair like on every single display ad. And then you start getting these emails from like, you know, the table you wanted, right? And you're like, oh, that's weird. No, no ads, no you know, private browsing. We could, I, I have the data to say, I can save you $362.50 per month because I know every single one of your loans, how much you're paying, what your monthly payment is. And because the credit bureaus are really good, they know exactly how much money you make. But that's weird, right? So it's a fine line. So we, we want to make a personal connection and there's ways to do it. But I told my staff, I said, you guys are not sitting in front of somebody eight hours every day. Pick up the phone, make the connection, go out to where you know they have, be the voice of your organization, and be a community credit union. The other piece, too, is that a credit union by nature is not for profit. So we have that built in with our model saying that you know, people helping people, not for profit, cooperative, those things work in our favor to get out and evangelize that we are here for you as owners and not for overall corporate profits and shareholders? It's a great question. Two. Anybody else or two? Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. I appreciate the invite. I'm sticking with you, too.